Dr. Librand and his wife, Jody, of 34 years, homeschooled their five children from birth to college, where they all excelled in academics and community, the University of Texas, and Abilene Christian. With their combined degrees, two BAs, two masters, one doctorate, Fred and Jody have stuck with their faith and their obsession with practical learning. As a result, the overall theme of teaching them to learn how to learn invades everything they offer. When it comes to diagnosing the fundamental dynamics of human systems, understanding their consequences, and developing nuanced adjustments that make a huge difference, Fred Librand has no peers. We used to smoke in a cigar, and he reaches under his seat and pulls out a, a stick of dynamite lights it and throws it right out there in the middle and kaboom water sprays and fish start floating up to the top he gets his trolling motor and he's got his net pulling in all the while sheriff Carr is reading him I think you call it the riot act you know do you know how many codes you're violating you know how illegal this is First of all, you can't harvest fish that way. They're environmental issues. What are you doing with dynamite? How'd you get hold of that? Uh, you are causing noise problems out here on this peaceful lake. I mean, this is against the law. And I mean, he's just going on and on and on and on, lecturing about the law and uh, what's fixing to happen. And Eustace just reaches under, gets another stick of dynamite, lights it, throws it in Sheriff's car's lap and says, so you gonna talk or you gonna fish? I want to welcome you to this training, this webinar, this system related to growing an independent learner. I want to start, however, with a little reality. If you're interested in homeschooling or are homeschooling, there's some things we might need to own up to. The first is that 3.3% of children are homeschooled. That adds up to close to 2 million children. Some estimates are closer to 3 or 4. Most parents homeschool for multiple reasons. The most common reasons were concern about the environment in other schools, academics, and religion. High school dropout homeschool at the highest rate. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, 4.4% of children whose parents have not completed high school were homeschooled, compared to 3.6% of children whose parents have a bachelor's degree. Homeschooled students have a math gap. A wide range of studies have found that homeschooled students underperform in math relative to their peers. Several studies indicate that this math gap results in a lower percentage of homeschoolers pursuing degrees in STEM fields, engineering and mathematics and such technology. Homeschool students may under-attend college. Homeschool students take the SAT and the ACT, often viewed as proxy for intent to attend college at far lower rates than other students. Most states offer no accountability for homeschooling. Now, there are obviously counters and nuances to all those things, but we don't need to be confused into thinking that homeschooling is a magic bullet or a magic uh, pill uh, for all things academic and social. Here's my promise to you. If you'll give me some time here, I'm going to give you 10 lessons you can use immediately to grow independent learners. I'm going to give you 10 exact gems that will show you some things you can start doing today that will help your children. Jody and I successfully homeschooled our five kids from birth to very successful college experiences and viable careers. There they are with their spouses, 
Brooks, uh, there the third from the far left, uh, will be getting married shortly uh, before the end of, um, gosh, the end of this spring and before he begins his fourth year at the University of Texas. Now, I will tell you, he's going to graduate a year early, all the while supporting himself through school, making incredible grades, double majoring, and being heavily involved in uh, Christian ministry at the University of Texas. We are proud of these kids and can tell you at least our homeschooling efforts don't seem to have hurt any of them. I pastored two Texas churches over a 25-year period in Midland and in the San Antonio area. Jody and I talk, I talk communication at the University of Alabama. Jody and I have combined degrees in education, English literature, communication, Bible and applied theology, including two master's degrees and one doctorate. 20 years of business systems and process redesign training and experience with hundreds of companies, nonprofits, churches, executives, and individuals. I've authored nine books on matters of family, faith, productivity, and communication. When we did have one child that really wanted to go to school and we let him go on a field trip and that field trip cured him pretty much. I remember field trip to school. To school, excuse me. <laughs> went went to school and suddenly realized how much of the day he was spending how about social and how busy work and how just spaced out and here's some of my story. I stuttered severely as about a five year old. Partly because, or maybe largely because, mother and dad were told by the experts in school to change me from being left-handed to right-handed. That messes up speech centers in the brain, and so I went through a stuttering phase that I experienced occasionally as panic all the way into college. I have not stuttered since then, that I recall, but uh, what a devastating, challenging thing to have this speech impediment shaking up your ability to t -t 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 talk and just express yourself. I also had the dubious honor of flunking the ACT English section. Uh, oddly enough, I majored in English literature, but in coming at it uh, from a testing viewpoint and trying to understand and overthink uh, English, I actually couldn't understand what was up. I was so obsessed on the rules instead of what I've learned to do, and that is to be focused on communicating and enjoying the variety that our amazing language gives us, our language instinct gives us, as well as English being pretty cool too. I also want you to know I grew up in an alcoholic family and was what they call parentified. So alcoholic family you're probably familiar with. And that's where uh, everyone pretty much had challenges with organizing their life around alcohol. Uh, dad in the course of time died of a cirrhotic liver. Uh, mother uh, actually gave up uh, alcohol for um, uh, the significant last half of her life. But nonetheless, when you grow up in a, in a system that is organized around this, this trying dysfunction of an addiction, it tends to create a significant amount of pain. And how I recall and remember just wanting a family to be a family. You know, in the course of time, church became nothing. One of my favorite last memories was sitting between mom and dad at church I was a teen of some type, one of the few times we went, and just for a moment, feeling something was special right then, that we were doing something as a family. Uh, those moments were few and far between, but they significantly motivated me to be doing what I'm doing today. 
fact, you could ask, why am I so interested in helping others grow independent students? And I'll tell you, there are several reasons. One is this is what I wanted as a kid, to just let my mind and my interest be unleashed to do something and to figure out something useful and exciting. I also can tell you I'm burdened because what I've seen with our five kids, Jody and our efforts and how it's impacted them and what uh, amazing, uh, cool uh, human beings they are and that they've married. Really quite amazing. But kind of beyond all that, this is sort of missional for me. Do you know we could change the world? If we can put more students out there who can outthink people, who can outstudy people, uh, who can operate with some sanity and some reasoning, those sparks could light a fire of transformation for this culture and this world. It's happened before. No reason it can't happen again. But as long as we all pull in the direction of just simply what we're told instead of thinking clearly and independently, not much chance of that happening. So what's the problem with homeschooling? Well, there are a couple of things. The first is a lack of confidence competing against the school system. Now, here's what I mean by that. This lack of confidence that we tend to have is pretty powerful because we have um, decades and decades of this factory model of education. You know, even bells to tell when the shift is over. Move to your class, uh, move to your next class. But this lack of confidence comes from feeling like we're competing against this system. So this system has uh, multiple teachers who are somewhat specialized in what they do. And uh, in that specialization, they have incredible resources, incredible facilities, and a system that gives the appearance that it's going to really load into our children incredible knowledge for the future. So when we try to compete against all of that, we can't do it. One person can't be an expert at everything, much less our facilities are a little more toned down. It's a schoolroom. It's go out and play in the yard, you know, hang out with your friends. And, and there's beauty to all of that and, and great impact. But it undermines our confidence as long as we think that that mass educational way is the only way to make it happen. There's also this massive time commitment. One of the great challenges we all have with uh, home education is just simply how much time it can take. Now, on one level, you can say, well, it may not take that much time because we're integrating it with, with life. But, but imagine your life if your kids are not there for six or eight hours of the day, the things you can get done and accomplished, assuming that they're getting educated and developing healthy uh, social relationships and sports and character, etc. The reality is if we don't organize our lives properly, uh, homeschooling can really overwhelm almost anyone. I remember years ago, <laughs> I heard a, a radio show and it said, you know, most mothers secretly just want to run away from home from time to time. I thought that was hilarious. And I went home and I said to Jody, I said, I heard this that y'all want to run away. She looked at me, she said, oh yes, totally. Uh, what a fun thing to learn and to get to work on. She never ran away, by the way. So what is the problem with homeschooling a little further? I got this recently from a mom writing me on Facebook. She said, I'm grossly behind. My children are poor spellers and disinterested in reading for pleasure. Is there any hope of catching up or even thriving at this point? I hear this all the time. We, we're grossly behind. There are certain deficits. We have learning disability, learning challenges. We're, we're behind in certain subjects. I don't know if we can catch up. I don't know if we can do it. Well, that all is just symptomatic of not having a system uh, that could really work well for us. So what's the solution? I'm going to argue there are three parts to this solution. See if these resonate with you. Part number one, you need the right thinking. The right thinking, the way I like to say it, is it's very difficult to think crooked and walk straight. So the right thinking for an independent learner 
is for them to become their own teachers. Imagine the time savings alone and the security for the rest of their lives. If your children, actually your students, your home school students, learn to teach themselves, learn to figure out for themselves. And I'll tell you, we know they can do it. Years ago, a couple of decades ago, when computers were the rage, I remember talking to some moms about they were wanting to, their children to take programming at Fortran or who knows what it was back then, Cobalt. Uh, so they're taking our basic probably, but they're taking some kind of computer programming. And I'm sitting there, I, wasn't, I was not being rude, but it did strike me funny because I was, I was watching these kids master the computer faster than the parents could understand it. The parents were trying to teach themselves basic to teach their kids, which should never work. I said, nobody's going to keep using that in the future. And they'll learn it. And that's what we found. Kids teach themselves. It's incredible. Well, imagine what would happen in your life if your role was to facilitate them learning to educate themselves. And imagine what happens to their own confidence, ultimately. Jordan Peterson, uh, educator, um, taught at Harvard, and he teaches in tr at Toronto University. Ask the question, is it better to help your kids be strong or safe? And his conclusion is dead right, and that is for them to be strong. We tend to want them to be safe, but the truth is if we can make them strong, that's the best path to safeness. Safe is keeping them at home. Strong is preparing them to go out and establish their own homes. If they're strong in their character, and they're strong in what they can handle, and they're strong in their academics, strong in their ability to read, strong in their ability to solve problems, imagine how safe they are. In fact, that's the foundation for them being leaders, so they make others safe too. Second, it's the right skills. Now, in our approach, in our training, what we finally figured out is there are a number of areas that we had to equip the kids in or had to encourage the kids to equip themselves. And so we have 50 plus hours of mentoring courses and they deal with things like this, how to run your emotions for kids. It is an amazing thing. In fact, uh, that course alone probably is maybe the only one people need. When children can start handling their own upsets, their own frustrations, uh, you don't have to. In fact, the most common thing I hear is from moms that said, oh, I wish I'd learned this for myself because it's so powerful to not being manipulated in this world by reacting to everything going on. The ability to focus. You know, focus is something I think in my experience, most anyone can learn. I'm sure there are a few neurological challenges that are extreme, but there, there still is a, an ability, a way structurally to establish focus. And then you can grow a little more and grow a little more. A third of our courses is on problem solving. This is probably the most complete one because it's the love of my life. But learning this skill, mathematics is problem solving, but the, the skill of being able to look at a problem and really understand it, generate alternatives, run in your head through how those alternatives work out, pick the one that's best, and move on and knock it out. That's where job uh, improvement is. That's where raises come from. That's where promotions are because everyone's hired to solve problems. If you create more problems than you solve, they fire you. Goal setting. How does that work? How do you get children to have visions for what they want out of their future? I had an amazing note from a mom share that her uh, challenged uh, son, academically challenged son, I forget the nature of the disabilities he was struggling with, but uh, some special needs-ish, but he did everything with the rest of his siblings, but towards his senior year went through this material and went to a store, I think it was Walmart, secured his own job, has already advanced some, starting to figure out how to do things to, to contribute in life in ways that he finds meaningful and challenging. Reading, how to really understand, to comprehend. They call it reading comprehension. It should be called comprehension because that's essential. If 
you can read all the words but don't know what it means, what does it matter? Well, this is material that I developed over the decades of how I can look at 20% of the material and understand 90% of the information, never mind I can read it all too. Writing, our writing course is pretty well known uh, to really unleash students from the fears and the misunderstandings about uh, how grammar and punctuation and generating ideas and fear actually works. Memory, how to go about uh, tapping into an, an organic mnemonic system so that you can put into your head massive amounts of information for any job, college, high school, life. The ability to remember is incredible. Time management. How do you organize things such that you get things accomplished? How do you create a way for projects and day-to-day -day and the, the use of lists, especially if you hate such things? Um, how do you get it to work? We'll show you how. Communication. I taught speech at the University of Alabama, I mentioned, and this has been one of the really the burdens of my life to understand how to communicate, how language works, how do we form information to communicate and use it with other people. Well, there are principles, there are incredible things that we can learn and teach about how communication really works. What a tremendous golden skill for anyone. Relationships related to, in some ways, many of these things. But how do you develop friendships for life? How do you find the right life partner? How do you make conflict issues work? That's what we focus on in teaching about relationships. So here is promised. I want to share with you these gems through these topics. One gem from each of these skill sets. Now, if you have not been taking notes, this is the place to get a pen and paper and write these things down. 10 strategic tips to grow independent learners. Number one, emotions. Here is one tactic we teach you. One of, I mean, all of these have dozens and dozens, but it's about patience. And it's to use this phrase, it won't last forever. Whatever anyone's going through, you can say it to your kids when they're doing a house project or yard project. It won't last forever. Uh, their homework or their writing time or their math time, whatever they're struggling with, it won't last forever. I learned this by getting online with tech people. So I get online with tech people and they may take hours. A few weeks ago, I was on for three hours. And all I kept telling myself is it won't last forever. And when I can realize something won't last forever, I get calm, and you will too. What frustrates us is when we think something is going to last forever. That means we're in a bad, eternal place. Problem solving. Here are the three steps. You learn this, you teach your kids, it'll change everything. You want them to see, and then simplify, and then solve. You want them to see what's really going on. Uh, word problems, this is a great example. You look at a word problem, they need to see all the elements. This person is this distance, moving in this direction. Another person, a distance, a direction. It's trains, not cars, not airplanes. It's in this uh, context. And when, when they start thinking through and seeing all the ingredients, then they can simplify it. It's about moving in direction one way and then back in another then you're in a position to solve it. Start stressing this as you look at problems. See, simplify, solve. Time management. You want to start using closed lists. I call these will do as opposed to uh, to do or actually may do list or won't do list. A will do list looks like this. You figure out in a day what you're going to do and write that on a list. And if you're not sure if you're going to do it, you can't write that down. And if you know you won't do it, you don't write that down. In fact, the easy thing to do is just look at it and say, will I do this? And if you say yes, then you ask, will I really do this today? And if you say maybe, then that's not one. These are the things you will absolutely do. Hey, you can add to it later, but it's a closed list. 
If you want to do more at the end of it, fine. But figure out those three or four things. Maybe that's all there is that you will do that day. And then close off that list. And you know, when you do that, the priorities don't matter because you're going to do them all. What does it matter what order they come in? Learn to use closed lists. Uh, this is what we do in homeschool too. Essentially, each day is a closed list of what the kids are going to accomplish by each subject. That's the goal. So many pages, so many problems. It's a closed list. It's not open-ended. It's not do the best you can, see how far you can get. It's a very specific thing. Just dramatic on your time. In writing, you want to teach your children to focus on the three stages of writing. And they work like this. Okay, get help and make great. Initially, you're wanting to get a child to just write something that is okay. It doesn't have to be great. In fact, you can't start with great. You can't start with perfect. You can start with okay, though. And they ask the question, can I write an okay sentence? Can I write an okay paragraph about my dog or whatever it is? And the answer should be yes. And you want them to go for okay. I have all told kids I've tutored, if you write something great to begin with, I'll throw it away. I don't want to see great. I want to see okay. And then you get help. You can give yourself help. You can get other people to read it. You, mom, dad, can obviously give a child help. But they need to learn to get help so that another a uh, set of eyes can look at it. You know, historically, books, when they go through editors, a dozen editors, more, always have to. Always can catch things that are mistaken, errant, a little confusing. Then you do a little rewriting, corrections, amendments, and you make it great. The goal is to make it a really great thing, I think. But you don't start there. Start with okay, get help, make it great. In reading, First, don't read. Look for a schema. Here's what that means. If you can teach your child not to just start in reading, reading first, don't read, look for the schema. That really works against the brain because the brain doesn't know what to do with all that information. It's, it's hard to organize it. I like to think of it like parking cars in a parking lot. I have a friend who lived in Alaska and the parking lot was snowed over during church when they, I mean, before, on the way to church. And so they all parked as best they could when they came out this late spring. Uh, it had melted and all the cars were parked in weird ways because they couldn't see the lines in the parking lot. Well, if you can scan over anything you're reading and kind of look at it, first sentence, last few sentences, uh, scan through it and kind of figure out what this is about. Even knowing it's fiction versus nonfiction, knowing that it's a, it's a historical document, knowing it's a, an essay that's laying out three major points, any kind of schema you can look at with your reading for that day or for that moment will allow your brain to organize the information. And you'll instantly, instantly be a better reader. Focus. No one can focus, but everyone can grow focus. In fact, the more focused you are, the worse you drive. I had three focused kids, and they were dangerous. Our two less focused could interrupt themselves and look left and look right. None of us are focused to begin with. Just watch children, whoever. This happens, a leaf blows over, a sound over here. That's how we live. We're taking in all this lateral information. Focus is sort of an unnatural thing. We can get engrossed in something. But that's what we grow. It's, it's learning to shut down that natural ability to protect ourselves by being able to look left and right, to take in varieties of information and to say no, kind of develop an auditory or visual blindness for a moment. So we're just focusing on the thing at hand. Starting out with this understanding begins to change everything. Nobody is really naturally a focuser. They don't naturally focus. They naturally don't, as I said, look at children. But you can learn to do it. You can learn to develop, to grow the ability to engross yourself and put attention on it. What we tend to do is think that some kids can, some kids can't. What a mistake. What a mistake. Next, goal setting. One of the gems for goal setting is to understand goals are guaranteed. Hopes and aims are not. We often will use lingo that's a little confusing, and we, we could debate this, but I, I've found it's best to just think about goals as something I can guarantee. 
And something I hope for or I aim at or an objective is something I cannot guarantee. So I use a business example. It just makes easy sense to me. You could have a salesperson. And, and the hope of the salesperson, let's say, is to sell a million dollars this year of, of, of whatever they sell. And, and, and in that hope of selling a million dollars, they can't guarantee or control that. There's no way to. But they can guarantee or control the number of people they talk to every day. So a goal in that sense would be, how many people am I going to pitch what I sell to a day? And the hope would be the byproduct, what I think is possible, but I can't guarantee it is something different. Learning to teach our kids to separate what they hope for in life from what they can guarantee are two different things and very, very powerful because it kind of relates even to focus. Because if we can do the things that we can guarantee that should lead to our hopes, things work out. Memory. Memory works best as we learn to talk to our brains. Now, this is kind of my craziness, but if you'll give it a try, it's pretty cool. And, and the way it works is, you know, we have a mind, brain, you know, we're us, we can notice how we think, and I don't want to get into the nature of self-consciousness and that whole conversation, but the way this works is pretty simple. When we, when, well, let me just describe me. When I ask my brain how it would remember something, when I say, well, how would you remember that? Well, it almost always comes up, well, I'd think of it this way, and it comes up with some odd thing. I used to have the, a problem spelling the word implement. I M P L. I'd say I implement. I don't know why. Probably compliment or something. There's some word that's spelled that way. Um, maybe not that one, but implement. And I one day finally asked my brain. I said, "Well, how would you remember it?" And it said, uh, "I would remember like French le implement l e." Well, what that told me was in compliment when I got to the C O M P L. Not I, but E, L-E, le, implement. That's crazy, but that's me. That's not something important to you. But, but if your kids get used to asking themselves, okay, brain, how would you remember it? It'll come up with a natural kind of organic association that it will probably come up with next time. And obviously, after you review it a few times, you don't need the memory trick. You just remember it. So, talk to your brain. Communication. First understand, then disagree. One of the most powerful things you can do. First understand what someone's saying and then disagree. I'll often say to people, I know I want to disagree with you, but I don't know what to disagree about because I don't understand your view yet. Would you help me understand your view so I can find out what I disagree with? I've never had anybody not say sure. And so they tell me, and I'll say, let me see if I understand it. And I'll say it back, and they either say yes or no and tweak it until they say, yes, you've got it. I don't understand their view. So if you can practice this in a family to say, okay, let's have a disagreement, but let's first understand each other. What's he saying? What's she saying? Once they get that clear, you'll find out what they disagree about is about 10% of the conversation, not 80. And it cuts down on conflict. And last, Relationships. You'll never be like the people you don't hang around. It's one of the principles we taught our kids. We, we learned it really in the Bible. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 33 that says, Bad company corrupts good morals. You'll never be like the people you don't hang around. If you don't hang around drug dealers, you won't be like them. If you don't hang around intelligent people, don't worry, you won't be like them. If you don't hang around spiritual people, don't worry, you won't be like them. You'll never be like the people you don't hang around. This is probably one of the bigger things in the Librand family that we send them out into life with. To be able to choose those friends carefully because of how much influence they have on them and, and they on their friends. So, are independent learners employable? I'd say it this way. If you can think and speak, or rather, excuse me, I'm quoting Jordan Peterson here because he's on target. If you can think and speak and write, you're deadly. In a complex job, you are exactly what's necessary. Sorry they misspelled your. That is so true. When, when someone can think 
and can speak and can write, they're deadly in a job. There's not that much competition either. Because complex jobs, this is exactly what they have to be able to do, to think and speak and write. I can't tell you how many executives I work with that are just overwhelmed with people they are getting in college-educated that just aren't good at these things. Imagine what happens when you lay down a foundation of thinking, speaking, and writing to prepare your child for whatever they're headed for. Makes them employable for a long time. He is a genius at systems, so when our children were younger, he gave us some st systems and strategies for helping us figure out um, the, the best way to have the least amount of friction in our home and how to um, just, he, he just coaches you on how to take your personality and your children and figure out a way to make your home the best possible environment. Uh, possible for your kids to raise your kids in. I would highly recommend and encourage you to consult with Fred Lybrand. He is a tremendous godsend. Thank you, Fred, for the impact you've made on our lives. Just another uh, sweet uh, family that we've had the privilege of cheering for, and there are lots of them that we've been able to pass on to others, <clears throat> things that people have passed on to us, or we've had to oftentimes just figure out the hard way as well. I want to encourage you to teach the gateway skill. And the gateway skill is to learn how to learn. It opens up everything. We use this phrase in a lot of ways. Usually, I think I heard of it like gateway drugs. Take some smaller drug and leads to the other one. But a gateway is just something that opens up, right, to a, to a new path, a new area, a new domain. Well, the domain is learning how to learn. Once a, once a student knows how to learn, or a person knows to, how to learn, he or she can re-educate themselves whenever they need to. Our kids didn't know that much about Texas history. They did some, but certainly not Maine's history. But if anybody moves to Maine, I am quite sure my kids could sit down in about three weeks, learn enough about Maine to know more than 99% of the people they'll ever meet while they live in Maine. Because once you know how to learn, you can teach yourself anything. The three skills your student must master and why. I've laid them all out together, reading, writing, and arithmetic, as it were. I'm not trying to unravel these. I just want to explain them all because I think we underappreciate what these do. It works like this. Reading, once you can read and understand as we discuss, if you can make sense of these words, these abstractions, these letters combining words and sentences and paragraphs, you suddenly have the ability to tap into the best minds throughout history or currently alive in the world. That ability to read puts you in a position to be able to find out information that you can use for anything. Now, uh, Plenty of literature says not only it does that, but reading itself makes your brain healthier, stronger, faster, quicker. Uh, very different than like watching TV or video. There's a different dynamic structurally with the, the reading, the impact of reading. But, but it opens you up to that world and turns around because it moves to number two, writing. Writing then is a way for two things to occur. That is communication with other people. So now you can interact and work in this world because you're using this reading thing in a different way with writing as a communicator, a higher level rhetoric, as they call it, a skill, a rhetorical skill. But writing does something else powerful, dramatic, and that is it gets you to think things through. You simply can't uh, think as poorly after you've written about something as you did before. <laughs> Look, writing allows you uh, a feedback loop, as they call it, to, to really understand what you're thinking. You tend to learn by writing. You know, they, the famous writers have pointed this out. They, they tend to be of the sort that learn and so write, but then write and so learn. It's a relationship between these two. Now, math is a kind of reading because it's a language for the sciences. So, so math is really the language for all that STEM stuff. 
that, that when you understand the language of math, you're open up to that whole world of scientific investigation, all the careers that go with it. But math is something else for you, and that is it's teaching you logic, cause and effect. It teaches absolutes, tend to be right and wrong. Isn't that fun? There, there are so many things that are generated out of math in terms of making your brain work functionally, understand the logic of something, making sense of things, that we grossly neglect this area. And sadly enough, anyone can learn math, to, despite what you think, just like pretty much anyone can learn to write and anyone can learn to read. And I don't mean that you're going to be an all-star, but functionally, yeah. And it wires up the brain to equip our kids to be these learners, these independent learners we want them to be. The third thing uh, as we're going through all this is you need the right purpose. The right purpose uh, adds real momentum to what you're trying to do as a mom and dad in homeschooling. And in my understanding, the right purpose, there is what we might call a most important distinctive. <clears throat> And, and the distinctive is this. Schools say education is about knowledge and testing. Just go and watch. It's all about knowledge and testing. They may say something different, but look what they model. Knowledge and testing. Just no more, no more, no more, no, no more. Even, even uh, private schools I've been involved with will gravitate towards busy work and knowledge. Like if you know enough to win Jeopardy, that means you're educated. What a strange thought. And then they measure this by testing. And testing is largely measuring to some degree skill, but... A lot of it's knowledge, isn't it? Here's what I'd like you to rethink. The truth is that education is about skills and character. Yeah, and character is its own conversation, but it's a big deal. And sadly enough, a lot of our character stuff is taught more through uh, sports and the arts than it is through uh, the educational process, because the educational process, you need to expose people to writers with character to make them think about more noble things than they're used to thinking about. Education is really about this skill set, reading, writing, arithmetic. You know, there's more to it. But these skills, they become the tools that we have in our tool chest or how we can go about learning. We know how to break down a topic. We know how to understand it. We know how to analyze it. We know how to rhetorically explain it persuasively. We know how to defeat errant views. We know how to research. We know how to understand footnotes and how to document what we're doing, how to research something, how to find something. All of these skills as we work in relationships, as we work in being able to recall things accurately, all of these skills come together to make us into independent learners. I bought your course several years ago. It changed my son's life. He screamed and cried daily in third grade over writing one sentence. He got his score from his ACT writing portion yesterday and was one point from a perfect score. Thank you so much for making this. So many times <clears throat> we've heard, especially in our writing material but other, of how people have gone from not writing a sentence to writing small novels. That comes by the right kind of knowledge in the right moment. But more importantly, this mom and so many others following the system and getting the kids to practice so that, as Emerson said, the greater part of courage is having done it before. A lot of what we're doing in education is getting our kids to, you know, try green eggs and ham. I like them. I like them. Sam, I am. I want you to appreciate the fact that mentors change lives. There is no faster way, no surer path than finding a mentor who's made it happen. If you think of examples like Socrates and Jesus, it turns out to be really true. Um, the, the Greek world is kind of amazing because the, the way the Greeks thought about education, e ducare, uh, tied in this Roman, they stole it from the Greeks, this whole conversation about to draw out, to lead out, to pull it out of you. They, they didn't think of the mind as blank, uh, slate, you know, that you write on. They thought of that in this history of knowledge, you already had it in you, somehow born in, tapped into the ether, however they thought about it intergenerationally back. And there was a, a discovery of what you knew. 
And so these, these tutors developed, like Socrates, this history of it, they actually grew uh, mentoring so the tutor could learn more because they found that when they had students around them asking questions, making connections, they all learn faster in more profound ways. Jesus was not, in my opinion, uh, learning so much as teaching, but a similar thing. So when the disciples would uh, argue with each other, debate and discuss, or he'd throw out a question, then they'd discuss it together. There's a different kind of profound learning that goes on. When someone's ahead of you and understands it, they can show the right thought, the right strategic thing in the right moment. Way easier to learn it that way. They have apprentice programs. Most of the trades do. I work with a couple of plumbing businesses, and these guys are pretty amazing at having apprentices that work with you know master plumbers so they can learn the ins and out. That cuts down the learning like by years or decades because you don't have to learn it all yourself. You can just talk to someone who knows what they're doing. You can follow their actions. You can be on site and learn. True in any area in the world that when we can have a mentor that can guide us, it saves time and produces a far better result in being able to master that information. One of the things I've, I've noticed and uh, done a good bit of work in Uganda, one of the challenges they had with uh, so much death and challenges going back to the era of Idi Amin, etc., but uh, disease and people dying younger, not passing along skill sets of creativity and entrepreneurship and other stuff. That really slowed uh, the recovery in some of these areas pretty dramatically because of the power of what mentoring can do. Hi, my name is Laura Hanger, and I just wanted to share really quickly what I learned from being homeschooled or what I really took away from being homeschooled other than a great ed education. I really learned self-discipline. So that self-discipline really has carried through life, through college and now my career. Um, I definitely can say in college that I could sit down and write a paper and be self-disciplined to finish a project or study for a test where I would watch my friends go study with other friends or at Starbucks or somewhere else and it would take them a lot longer because they weren't necessarily getting done what they needed to get done and I just learned that self-discipline I could get it done and then go enjoy my friends or go do sports or go whatever it was um, and really just be able to feel relieved and not always thinking, oh, I need, I still need to study or I still need to write that paper. Um, but I could self-discipline and I could sit down and get it done. And I really carried that over even into my career. What a sweetheart. <clears throat> Our second child. Would you mind if I share how we grew five kids to become independent learners? without the help of any public or private school or any cooperative? Jody and I used our backgrounds and faith to uncover and focus on building a family of self-teaching and self-motivated students. The system is the solution. So what a system is, <clears throat> is a combination of elements that work together to produce a result. You're around systems all the time, traffic systems, or your body has an endocrine system, or digestive system, and all these different pieces work together. So thinking about education in a home as a system was a dramatic part of what we were able to figure out to help develop these kids as independent learners. Here's how you do it. You decide on your outcome. What do you want this system to produce? What's the result do you want? We wanted kids who could teach themselves anything. Number two, you design your plan. Set up a game plan as best you can figure out that will produce that outcome. May not be guaranteed, might be a byproduct as we talked about earlier. But you still have a game plan for doing it. And third, you document your process. In other words, you write it up and detail it. And the power of that is it allows you to make it visual so you can improve it. You can tweak it. 
In fact, what we like to do is write up our process, put it on the refrigerator, and cut a deal with the kids that we're going to try it for two months and have this meeting and evaluate it and see if we can improve it. And this process may have been about conflict or how to organize the home or how to do math. And we had a variety of them. You know, I think about <clears throat> uh, investing could be that, the daily investment uh, even of your money, how you spend it, a system. Do you um, systematically save a little uh, or do you just spend it all? Do you have any kind of systematic way to give some to charity, to put some towards uh, education of the kids? Any kind of system is going to work better. But the example I want to tell you about is the kids fighting. And so we had our last two fought more, and there's a long story as to why. Uh, my mistake, we've changed the system on them. But these guys were uh, really in some significant conflicts. And through a long story I won't tell because we have the videos kind of available in the family training. But, but basically, uh, in a moment of stark raving frustration, I got up in the middle of the night <clears throat> and sat down and wrote up a system for them. And I, I set this system on a refrigerator, explained it to both of them, and for the remaining year and a half they lived together in this home before uh, one of them moved to college, they never had a fight that I know of. I mean, they had some conflicts, but they solved them very quickly. And basically, we had set up a process, a system, that very specifically rewarded them, rewarded them for resolving their own problems and punished them, as it were, for having out-of-control conflicts. But if we didn't think of it as systems and documenting the process, we never would have gotten there.